Hey Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here, and whether the government wants to admit it or not, we could be in a recession right now. We're about to see data released on the economy that could mean six months of a slowing economy has already passed, putting us deep into a recession. In this video, I'll give you a complete guide to what happens in a recession, from the definition and what causes recessions, to jobs lost, how to survive, and investing in stocks. I'll leave a clickable index in the description if you want to jump around to your recession questions. And more than just the definition of a recession though is how these make us feel on an emotional level. That sense of hopelessness and terror in the uncertainty that, that I'm trying to relate in this video. You know, I told my wife that we should get a dog and call it Noodles. She said, that's silly, we eat noodles. And I replied, well, if this recession gets bad enough, we might just have to. We're getting started, but before we do, you know I've gotta send that special shout out to all you out there in the nation. Thank you for spending a part of your day to be here. If you're not part of that community yet, just click that little red subscribe button. It's free and you'll never miss an episode. Now we talk about a recession as if it's easily definable and affects all people the same way. The truth is how it affects you can depend on a lot of factors. So here's what to expect when you're expecting a recession. A recessions are officially identified by the National Bureau of Economic Research or NBER. And, and while most economists go by the rule of thumb that any two quarters of falling economic activity is a recession, the NBER never adopted that rule. Instead, the NBER defines a recession more broadly and Get your coffee ready because it's a real snooze fest. A recession is a significant decline in economic activity spread across the economy lasting more than a few months, normally visible in real GDP, real income, employment, industrial production, and wholesale retail sales. Oh, try saying that just before bed. But the reason the government looks at more than just that GDP estimate of whether the economy is growing or contracting is GDP can be misleading and miscalculated, so they want to look at the whole economy in parts. Now, the problem in all this is it means we never know if we're in a recession until after we're already in a recession. It can be a year or more before the NBER reports that recession started, which leads to all kinds of no shit moments, like when in December 1st, 2008, after stocks had already fallen 44%, after more than 8 million Americans had lost their jobs, the NBER announced a recession had officially started in December of the year before. Now, aside from all the technical jargon though, a recession is just when the economy as a whole, that's jobs, income, production, and investments all see a drop for more than a few months. So we know what it is, but what causes a recession? And it turns out there's really just three big causes for recessions over the last 70 years. Economic policy mistakes by the Federal Reserve, oil price shocks, and financial bubbles. Glasner and Cooley studied the causes of recessions back to 1948 and found the Fed fully or partially at fault in eight of the 11 recessions, or about 73% of the time. Now you see, the Fed, or the nation's central bank, tries to balance employment and inflation by, by lowering or increasing interest rates. When unemployment is high, it lowers the interest rates, but that can cause inflation, so then it needs to raise rates and cool down the economy. A recession usually happens when the Fed keeps interest rates too low for too long and then has to raise rates aggressively to fight inflation. That's what we're seeing right now, with inflation touching 40-year highs above 8%, and the Fed will have no choice but to increase interest rates to slow the economy. The problem is, as we see here where it says tight monetary policy, the Fed has a lousy track record of raising rates and fighting inflation without sending us into a recession. In fact, I would also add the Fed to the causes of the 2007 housing bubble recession as well. It was those super low rates after the 2001 recession that fueled those house prices and mortgage loans in the first place and, and drove that bubble in prices. Here you can see the interest rate set by the Fed all the way back to 1955. And, and while it doesn't cause a recession immediately, as interest rates head higher and, and make borrowing more expensive, then a recession is never too far away. Interest rates started this year at zero and the Fed expects to raise it 3.5% by the end of the year. So yes, we are probably heading for a recession if we're not already in one yet, but, but if we are, how long do recessions usually last? And maybe that's the good news here. Over the last 70 years, recessions have been fairly short, lasting only 11 months on average, but but that average hides some big variation. The chart here by Haver Analytics ranks recessions by length, and while most have lasted less than a year, there are a few that hit especially hard. The recessions of 1973, 81, and 2007 all lasted around a year and a half, and 
for anyone around during those, you felt it. I was only five during the recession of 81, but I still remember it because that was the year that both my parents were laid off within two weeks of each other and we almost lost our house. Now, even if recessions are shorter, they can still hit hard, but, but how far does the economy fall in a recession? On average, the economy has fallen by 2.1% in the last 11 recessions back to World War II, but just like that recession length, that hides a scarier potential in individual recessions. Some recessions are fairly meek, like the 2001 recession that saw the economy lower by less than half a percent and job losses mostly in the IT space. Others like the Great Recession starting in 2007 were much worse, with the economy falling a full 4% and 8 million Americans put out of work. Most of us remember the 2007 recession, right? How scared we all were that this would be the next decade-long depression and, and that sense of terror of the uncertainty. But now all this talk of GDP or, or the economy on average doesn't really put a perspective on recessions though. When you think of a recession, you think of jobs. In a 2010 study by the Harvard Business Review, through the 1980, 90, and 2000 recessions, 17% of 4,700 public companies either went bankrupt, were taken private, or acquired. During the Great Recession, more than 2.1 million Americans were laid off in 2009 alone, and 6 million before that in 2008. On average, the unemployment rate rises by 2.7% through a recession, which would be about 4 million jobs on the current workforce. The chart here shows how much the unemployment rate has increased in each post-war recession. Now, recent recessions have been much worse though, with 5.7% of workers laid off, about 8 million in 2007, and the pandemic unemployment rate jumping 11%, or nearly 17 million jobs lost. And now for those with lower levels of education, a recession is a double kick in the nuts. Not only do they have higher unemployment rates to begin with, but they're more likely to lose their job in a recession. For example, in the 2007 recession, those with less than a high school education started with an unemployment rate of 5.8% and saw that spike to 15.8% through the recession. A 1 in 10 workers lost their jobs. Compare that against those with a college degree starting at just 1.8% unemployment rate that rose to 5% over the next year. Deloitte studied the average job losses in each industry during recessions to find those safest jobs, though, though like a lot of these numbers here, this is going to be more specific to the individual recession. They did find, though, that jobs in education and health services saw the lowest job losses across the 11 recessions at an average of just one in 100 jobs lost. State and local government jobs also came out relatively safe, while jobs in mining, manufacturing, and constructions have been the hardest hit when the economy falls. Now, the old joke is a recession is when your neighbor loses their job. A depression is when you lose yours. But what's the real difference between a recession and a depression? An economic depression is even less well-defined, but usually means a drop of at least 10% in the economy. So if you consider the average recession is about a 2% drop, then, then a depression is five times that. Depressions also last three years or more, or about three times longer than a normal recession. Now, we've only had one official depression in the United States, so it's a little hard to talk about what one looks like or, or how it would feel, but just remember that scale, three to five times worse than a recession, and, and you start to put that into perspective. Of course, the question everyone is asking right now is, is the U.S. in a recession, or when might one begin? And going off that rule of thumb for two quarters of a falling economy, it doesn't look good. The economy fell by 1.6% in the first quarter on supply chain and oil price shocks along with the start of the Fed increasing interest rates. And we were expecting the economy to bounce back strong in the second quarter and not hit a slowdown until next year as the Fed continues to raise interest rates, but, but it looks like we could already be in a recession. The Atlanta branch of the Fed tracks the economy through its GDP Now tool, an estimate of activity similar to the official one used by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And just recently, that tracker dropped into oh shit territory. The bank now estimates that the economy dropped by 2.1% on a year-over-year -year basis in the second quarter, even worse than the drop in the first quarter. And now with the tracker off an average of just 0.3% since 2011, it looks definite we're gonna see two consecutive quarters of decline in the economy when the second quarter GDP is announced soon. Now again, it's all up to this National Bureau of Economic Research to officially announce a recession, but Looking at these real numbers here takes the politics out of it and leaves little doubt. All right, now we're into the practical part of the video, and I don't blame you if you just skipped ahead because all the technical definition of a recession is probably only interesting to nerds like myself. In this part though, I'm gonna show you how to survive a recession, whether you should buy a house, and 
how to invest in a recession. First though, I wanna personally invite you to get the weekly bow tie, our free weekly newsletter with all the stock market news, strategies, and trends you need to know. Each week before the market opens, I'll show you what I'm watching and the stocks that could highlight the week. It's all totally free, just something I like to do for all you out there in the community, so look for that sign up link below. Now, surviving a recession financially comes down to just five questions and what you do about the answers. These are how safe is your job and your income? How close are you to not being able to pay the bills right now? Do you have an emergency fund? What are some side hustles you can do to build up that cash cushion? And what are some longer term passive income ideas you can use to supplement your income sources? We'll look at each one of these briefly, but I'll also leave links to full videos in the description below, so make sure you check those out. Now, we've already seen those safe jobs by sector, but that's not gonna save everyone, even in the safest of industries. Understanding how safe your job is could come down to an honest look at how you've been as part of the company and, and how unfireable you are. And for that, ask yourself these questions. Have you learned any new skills to be more productive at your job? Do you get along with your coworkers and your boss? Yeah, it sucks that, that keeping your job might be a popularity contest, but that's just how it is. Are you doing more or less work than you were last year? You know, someone always looking to carry more of the load isn't gonna be easy to replace. How was your last performance evaluation and what was your pay hike compared to the average? Now, if you do lose your job or your source of income, how close would you be to not being able to pay the bills? If you're barely making ends meet now, it's definitely time to start cutting back so you can save up some of that just in case money. I'm gonna to link to a video in the description on my favorite seven budgeting hacks, but, but I've gotta warn you, this was from 2018 and my delivery was absolutely cringeworthy. So, so watch for the tips and how bad I was at YouTube back then. Now go online and you're gonna see most experts recommending you have between three to six months of your expenses set aside in an emergency fund. And with the average expenses for a family of four at $5,000 a month and even higher in large cities, having six months or, or 30 grand set aside just isn't gonna happen for a lot of people. A more realistic would be just to start with two or three months worth of those absolute essentials in your budget, being able to pay your rent, utilities, and food, even if you lose your job. Because when push comes to shove, you can cut back on a lot of expenses like gas and that daily mocha coca cappuccino, but you're always gonna need a place to live. Sometimes though, you just can't get more from your budget. You can't save if you're barely making enough to pay the necessities now. now. If that's the case, it's time to consider a side hustle to build up that cash cushion in a recession. Now, I am not talking about a part-time job here. There are lots of side hustles you can do from home in as little as five or 10 hours and make a few hundred dollars a week. In the video I'm gonna to link to in the description, I'll show you in detail how to start seven different side hustles right from home. I'll also link to another video that's gonna take you a step further, showing you the passive income ideas I use that are gonna supplement your income for that long-term wealth. Here's a big recession question I had to include. Should you buy a house during a recession? We've been planning our move to Tampa for more than two years now, just waiting for the visa on our adopted daughter and, and have had to sit there watching house prices go through the roof. The good news for all us out there looking to buy, home prices typically fall during a recession and interest rates may fall as well, making it a great time to buy a house. This is a chart of the Case Shiller National Home Price Average and you can see the recession shaded here. The average home price fell 2.2% after the 1990 recession and plunged after the housing bubble burst in 2008. Even in that 2001 recession where home prices continued to rise on average, the annual increase slowed from 9.3% annual to just 6.1% at the bottom of the recession. Now it is important to notice though that home prices usually lag the rest of the economy and the stock market, so there is no rush to find a house to buy during the recession. For example, the steepest drop in home prices during the 1990, 2001, and 2020 recessions all hit after the recession officially ended. Now, the big problem lately has been that surge in interest rates. As the Fed raises rates, the average 30-year fixed rate mortgage has nearly doubled from 3% last year to 5.7% recently. Now, that's added $1,000 in monthly interest alone on the average new mortgage and basically it just means a lot of people are priced out of the market. It's harder to see in this chart because interest rates have been falling so consistently over the past 40 years, but there could be some relief coming for home buyers. Again, look at the shaded recession areas here. We do see that interest rates drop during those periods as the Fed reverses and, and tries to boost the economy by cutting rates. Now the bad news, that drop in home prices and the mortgage rates is great for buyers if you can find a bank willing to give you a loan. In a recession, most banks tighten their lending requirements, making it harder to get a mortgage. 
That means you're probably going to need a larger down payment and a better credit score to qualify. By now, you know everything you need to know about a recession, but all you out there in the Bowtie Nation know we're here to talk money. So how do you invest during a recession? This chart shows the bull and bear market since 1956, and while they don't line up perfectly with recessions, it's still pretty close. On average, the bear market has lasted nine months and seen stocks lose 28% from their peak. When that new bull market starts, it's lasted an average of 54 months and has seen stocks jump 129% from the bear market lows. Of course, that doesn't mean you should push all your money into stocks anytime the market falls 28% or, or sell out when it's up 129% in the bull market, but, but it does give you an idea of just how bad those bear markets can get in a recession. In a recession, the drop in stock prices comes from two main factors, negative investor sentiment and lower corporate earnings. With investors worried about their own jobs as well as what a slowing economy means for stocks, they tend to sell out of the market and cause stocks to crash. That usually happens even before we enter a recession, as investors watch the economy slowing or, or as the Fed starts raising interest rates and preparing for that. When the recession does hit and the economy slows, corporate earnings fall and that brings the next drop in stock prices. You see, as an ownership in the company, the very core value of a stock is those earnings generated by the company. In fact, that's why the price to earnings ratio is so popular. It's the price investors are willing to pay for a share of those earnings. But then when a recession hits and those earnings drop, then stocks are just worth less than they were the year before. So then investing before and through a recession is about finding those companies where earnings don't fall quite as much, though those sectors of the economy with more stable cash flows and business models. And we get a good idea of that in this chart by Fidelity. It shows each stock sector the average and median return during a recession phase of the economy. So if we look at the blue bars here, the average return for stocks in those sectors, we see three groups of stocks hold up best in a recession consumer staples, utilities, and healthcare. And that does make intuitive sense as well. The products sold by these companies in these sectors are things you need to buy whether the economy is growing or not. And so their cash flows and earnings are going to be pretty stable. Stocks and consumer staples include food processing, household cleaning, and personal products. Utilities are electric and gas companies, and that healthcare sector includes the drug makers, medical equipment, and distribution. Now, it is important to point out here that because the market is forward-looking, because investors tend to sell stocks and cause a crash even before a recession happens, then, then if you're protecting your portfolio like this, you need to shift your investments to these before this happens. For example, in the first six months of 2022, before a recession has been announced, but, but after stocks in the S&P 500 have already fallen 20%, stocks in the utility sector have only fallen half a percent, and healthcare is only down 3%. So, so investors shifting your money to those sectors have been protected. Now, as investors get ready for that rebound, preparing for the eventual economic growth after a recession, because remember, the average recession is only 11 months long, so they tend to pass really quickly. Here, investors start shifting early into the economically sensitive and the rate sensitive sectors like, like consumer discretionary, industrials, technology, materials, and financials. And stocks in these sectors are all very sensitive to the changes in the economy, falling faster in a recession, but then being the first to rebound when things improve. Click on the video to the right for a complete guide to the Series I savings bond, the best investment to protect and grow your money right now with a guaranteed yield over 9% a year. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.